Welcome back to the Pursuit of Accuracy. I'm Josh, and today we're taking a look at part two of our cold bore or dry bore or whatever bore testing you want to call it. So yes, we're going deeper down the rabbit hole. I promised you guys in part one that we were going to check out some Lapua SK products and some RWS, and we were going to see in the same exact rifle how those fared out on our first shot muzzle velocity jump we were experiencing. If this is not making a lot of sense to you and you haven't watched part one of this, I'm going to link that down in the description. You need to go watch part one first so that you will understand what we have going on here because this is a continuation of testing. But today I tread into unknown waters because I have not done this with either one of these ammunitions. Now I've shot both RWS and SK Lapua products long enough to know that I think I have a good idea of what's going to happen. So the first test we're gonna be doing is with the SK Lapua products. And what we did was yesterday I cleaned this rifle and I put about 20 or 30 rounds of this SK long range match through the gun. And then it's been sitting ever since. So it's about a full day later. And let's take this out to the range, shoot it over the chrono and see what we get. And we got the SK long range match loaded up in our mag here. And uh, we're gonna shoot five just like we did on the other test and see what we get. 1118, 1087, 1086, 1090, 1107, shoot one more, 1100, 1091, 1100. So there, if I'm not blocking the other camera, you guys can see we shot 1118, and 1087, 1086, 1090, 1107, 1100. We settled around 1100, so uh, not as bad. So we're looking at about 20 feet per second compared to 40 feet per second, but we are going to let this sit for 30 minutes. It's currently 238, hopefully you guys can see that. So same deal as always, guys. We are going to let the rifle sit out there for 30 minutes, and then we're gonna go back using the same exact lot of ammunition, same everything, and we're gonna reshoot the rifle and see if we get a first round muzzle velocity jump, much like we did on the last round, although it had been sitting a day. So essentially what we're doing is doubling down and making sure that the 30 minutes is long enough for this to induce some sort of muscle velocity jump. So we're back with the SK long range, same exact lot, uh, same mag, same actually rounds that were in the mag four. I did top it off with a couple. And just for you guys who are geeking out on some of this, it is a little bit colder today. It's about 46 degrees. It was about 60 degrees when we tested the Ely match. Not sure that that will matter. The relative humidity is about the same at around about, I don't know, 80% ish and uh, that's just kind of an average for the time that I'm out here. So 307 by the time we get everything loaded up uh, it should be 308. So 30 minutes haven't touched the rifle and uh, we're gonna find out together here pretty quick what the old SK long range capstone product does for cold bore. 1112, back down to 1090, 1090, 1095. All right, so I don't want to gloss over this um, and pass it up in the video, but we just got done shooting the SK long range match, and this lubricant on these projectiles is very greasy and very much different from most other match ammunitions available for 22 long rifle. It is very thin and it's the same lubrication across all the capstone stuff, at least all the match stuff. So what we saw there was about 50% of muzzle velocity jump on the first round compared to the Ely. So in part one, we shot the Ely and we tested that every way from Sunday and we got about 40 feet per second muzzle velocity jump on the first round. On this, we're getting around 20. So it's definitely not as impactful as the Ely lubrication, but we are still seeing something. And now that we have that nugget of information for the Lapua Capstone products, I think it's safe 
that we move on to the RWS special match. The only difference here is instead of cleaning the rifle, we're just gonna go ahead and foul it with the RWS out on the range. Really quickly, I wanna thank our channel sponsors, Utah Air Guns. And if you're already aware of who Utah Air Guns is and you already know that they are a massive air gun shop, but what you might not know is that they carry a ton of really cool precision rifle accessories. I'm talking Armageddon gear bags, Grey Ops weights, MDT weights, bipods, tripods, optics, mounts, and everything in between. So if you haven't went over to utahairguns.com, then I really appreciate you going over there and checking them out. And I think you'll be pleasantly surprised with what you find. And that should somewhat give us a good baseline for what we're looking at. Most of the numbers I saw were around 1100 to 1110 feet per second. So it is currently 310. So at 340, I will see you guys for the RWS test. Looky there, 340, it's been 30 minutes. Uh, I'm fairly excited about this. So we're gonna find out right now Make sure our chronographs lined up. It is, we're good to go. All right, let's see what the first shot does. RWS. Uh-oh, well, the first shot uh, didn't eject all the way. 1125. 11.09. All right, so I think that's, go on. Chickens everywhere, I don't know if you guys can see them, but they're making a bunch of noise in the video. So about 20 feet per second, the same as the Lapua capstone products as we shot the SK rifle match here. It's half the muzzle velocity jump we saw. But now what we're gonna do is, let's see, that didn't take very long. It's 341, I'm gonna go inside and warm up. We're gonna leave this gun out here just like we did for the last test. We're gonna come back out one more time because I know you guys are dying to know. We're gonna come out, leave it exactly as it was, and we're gonna use a straw and we're gonna see if we can normalize that first round muzzle velocity jump, and then uh, that'll be it for this one. And we're back. See there, it's 411. Gonna be shooting the same exact lot as always, and the only difference is, this time, we are gonna be using the straw. I think uh, one ought to do her. Let's see here. See what we got here, 1082, 1082, 1092, 1091, 1092, 1092, so on and so forth. So again, straw worked, um, and yeah, let's go wrap this thing up. So obviously it's been a day or two since I filmed this. I did all the filming on Friday and then I had to go play Army for the weekend. I am back Sunday night to wrap this video up. And I've been thinking about how I wanted to do this and I don't script any of my videos. So I just want to be flat out as honest and transparent with you guys as I can. Now, if you've watched part one and now part two of this video, we can deduce a few things about the lubrication type of the bullets. And there are some other things that we didn't talk about that I was originally going to do videos on, but the entire point of this video and a lot of the videos I do are to capture your guys' attention, get you thinking and get you out testing these things for yourself because the reality is there are just so many variables when it comes to rimfire. My rifles, my barrels, the kind of barrels they are, the rifling type they are, 
the ammunition I'm using, and a bunch of other factors could all contribute to this. And I've heard a bunch of theories. I am not dead set on one theory or another of what causes this. I do think it is friction based, but there are a lot of factors that I'm sure play into this. There have been gunsmiths on the first video commenting about tight spots in the barrel, and that makes a lot of sense to me too. They talked about some of the tools they used to mitigate that, and being that I think this is truly friction based, I think that all those things could become factors. Now, I've done a lot of testing and I don't take credit for any of this. These theories are just theories and things that I've tested or noticed over several months to a year now. So if anything, I attribute this to the testing that others have done before me. Those guys who I researched online found their information about using the straw to mitigate this. Greg Stewart for his method of blocking the barrel. And really the big takeaway here is if you have a cold bore shift, something that's causing that first round muzzle velocity spike, then I believe we have shown you two ways that are at least worthwhile of your time to go and try. So there are a few things yet that I would like to talk about towards the end of this video here. And that is the correlation between the muzzle velocity spike and a point of impact shift. Now, a lot of you guys who have the muzzle velocity spike don't necessarily have POI shift, especially at a fixed distance, because it is totally possible to have one without the other and or both, and especially at a fixed distance. And what I'm talking about is you could have 40 feet per second between shots and still hit the same exact spot on the paper at 50 yards. Now, when you stretch it out to 200 yards, I find it hard to believe that they would impact the same place. But I think it's important to note that because I think a lot of people do look at it just as a cold bore shift and that shift is when they're shooting paper at 50 yards and that first shot is going to be two tenths high or two tenths left or two tenths right or whatever it is. It's outside of the normal POI. But again, these are not mutually exclusive. And what I've tested across these two videos is the muzzle velocity spike. I didn't show the POI shift even though that Krieger barrel on that Voodoo does have a two tenths high POI shift with Ely ammunition with that 40 feet per second jump, but it's not going to be everybody's rifle. So again, guys, I appreciate you watching. This is going to be the end of the testing. I do encourage you to go out, test this for yourself. Take those two methods we use on the first video, blocking off the barrel and or using the straw. It's gonna cost you next to nothing to try them out. You probably have what you need at home and it's not going to hurt. But at the end of the day for a YouTuber, all I can hope for is that this has helped you guys. Hopefully you found it interesting and entertaining. And if you watched the first video and tested this on your own and you've had some sort of success or if you've tested it and it did nothing for you, then also let me know down in the comments below. I am not above learning anything. I could be completely wrong about the causes of this. And I enjoy hearing your guys' differing perspectives because you never know when you're gonna learn something new. So again, I appreciate you guys. We'll catch you on the next one.